Chapter 5. The Constitutional, Social, and Practical Necessity to Revitalize the Militia of the Several States. Refusing, failing, or neglecting to revitalize the militia of the several states is not a viable option, either for public officials or for we the people. Legally, it never was, is not now, nor ever could be. In no uncertain terms, the Constitution identifies the militia as the indispensable instruments for achieving homeland security. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state empowers Congress to employ the militia for salient tasks of homeland security, and to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. It also imposes on the United States the duty to preserve homeland security throughout the length and breadth of America's more perfect Union by protecting each of the states against invasion, and on application of the legislature, or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened, against domestic violence, two of the three purposes for which the militia are to be called forth. And it also requires the states to organize, arm, discipline, and train their militia whenever Congress refuses, fails, or neglects to do so, and in any event to govern whatever parts of their militia are not employed in the actual service of the United States. The Constitution expressly assigns none of these tasks to armies, to a navy, to a constitutionally unknown National Guard, or least of all, to any unnamed professional police, security, or intelligence agencies of the general government or of any state or locality. Rather, the Constitution's explicit emphasis on the militia as the preeminent forces for homeland security precludes as a matter of the supreme law of the land, the erection by politicians of a garrison, national security, or police state in response to some purported emergency arising out of widespread violations of the laws of the Union, insurrections, or other domestic violence or invasions. Officeholders' open defiance or reckless disregard of, or willful blindness to, what the supreme law plainly mandates in this particular amounts not simply to intellectual incompetence, political error, or even moral lapse. Rather, it is as well a constitutional crime of essentially boundless proportions, encompassing, as it necessarily does, responsibility for all of the deaths, injuries, and destruction of property all the infringements on individuals' fundamental constitutional liberties and kindred civil rights, and all the other evil consequences arising out of a garrison, national security, or police state that could be prevented by following the Constitution's directive concerning the militia. Officeholders and their advisors need to ponder this seriously, because the Constitution neither provides nor countenances any immunity from punishment or statute of limitations for such a crime. The senators and representatives in Congress, and the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by both or affirmation to support this Constitution. U.S. Constitution, Article 6, Clause 3. In addition, the President of the United States takes the oath or affirmation that he, quote, will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The very existence of these oaths or affirmations excludes the possibility of immunity from punishment for any officeholder who perjures or otherwise forswears himself. For example, when a member of Congress or a state legislator, knowingly, with willful blindness or in reckless disregard of the consequences of his action, votes for a statute that unconstitutionally suppresses the militia or supplants them with a garrison or police state, or when a president or state governor knowingly refuses to veto such a statute and instead executes it, 
or when a judge either of the supreme or inferior courts of the general government or of any state knowingly declares such a statute valid and enforceable, each and every one of them violates his oath or affirmation of office. Unless every such oath or affirmation is merely horatory rhetoric, an empty and impotent legal formality, no more than political double-talk, delusion, or deceit, then remedy must exist for every individual harmed by each and every such violation. That remedy must impose some personal liability on the violator, it being his own oath or affirmation that he himself foreswore. And that personal liability cannot be evaded by his or his crony's assertion of some ersatz, quote, official immunity. First, the Constitution itself provides for one and only one official immunity in its allowance that for any speech or debate in either House of Congress, senators and representatives shall not be questioned in any other place. Talk alone by those officers in that particular setting only is thus absolutely privileged, no matter how obnoxious, because thoroughgoing speech or debate should dissuade any honest member of Congress from voting for an unconstitutional statute. But as the Constitution plainly implies, the actual action of so voting and the ultimate untoward effects of a statute so enacted are quite different matters. Self-evidently, because the Constitution recognizes only this lone official immunity from liability for misuse of public office, no other can be interpolated into it for any other officeholder or for any other official action. Second, an implied constitutional power for public officials to create, quote, official immunities for themselves would allow them to negate the express requirement that they shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution and therefore cannot enter public office in the first instance or act under color of it thereafter without first taking and then continually abiding by such oath or affirmation. So even if, by some twisting of words, such an implication can be imputed to some other part of the Constitution, it would still fall afoul of the rule that, quote, if an asserted construction of any one provision of the Constitution would, if adopted, neutralize a positive prohibition of that instrument, then such asserted construction is erroneous, since its enforcement would mean not to give effect to the Constitution, but to destroy a portion thereof. The Constitution, after all, is not self-contradictory. So the affirmative words, shall be bound by, are plainly negative of other objects than those affirmed, and an exclusive sense must be given to them or they have no operation at all. Third, an implied constitutional power for public officials to create, quote, official immunities would be useless except to countenance, encourage, facilitate, and reward perjury and false swearing. For no public servant would ever need, quote, official immunity unless he had already violated or intended in the future either to violate or to proceed in reckless disregard of his oath or affirmation. Therefore, for any public official to create or to assert a purported official immunity for himself or any other official is itself a violation of his oath or affirmation. And because the creation or assertion of such a purported immunity is unconstitutional, the immunity can have no force or effect other than as evidence of its creator's or asserter's own wrongdoing. Moreover, no statute of limitations can foreclose impeachment and conviction, criminal prosecution, or some other sanction for a public official's violation of his constitutional oath or affirmation. After all, the harm in unconstitutional statute, executive or administrative order, or judicial decision inflicts on society does not end with its enactment or enunciation, but continues every day the evil screed remains on the books, 
to be executed, enforced, or treated as a precedent, or even simply to threaten people through its mere existence. And so long as a single one of those harms continues to beset society, the office holders responsible, including not only those who originate the offensive statute, order, or decision, but also all others who thereafter refused to repeal, revoke, overrule, or otherwise invalidate it, or worse yet, enforced or relied upon it, these remain liable. In addition, a purported statute of limitations, curtailing prosecution for any public official's violation of this oath or affirmation, would itself constitute a species of official immunity, the creation, recognition, enforcement, or assertion of which by any public official would amount to a separate violation of his oath or affirmation. In short, the only way for officeholders to avoid this unlimited exposure with respect to matters involving the militia of the several states is to revitalize the establishments without delay. Social considerations, too, strongly urge revitalization of the militia of the several states at the earliest possible moment. The militias will be not only protective, but also socially unifying forces. Indeed, service in revitalized militia could prove to be the best, if not the only way, to coalesce the vast majority of common Americans into a cohesive community of citizens committed to the common good. This is not simply because the militia of the several states are responsible for guarding America's national sovereignty by executing the laws of the Union. Her national integrity by suppressing insurrections, and her national independence by repelling invasions. And in the faithful performance of their duties, can never consciously serve the interests of foreign states, international or supranational organizations, or the agents these aliens deploy, and the quislings and collaborators they discover, plant, and cultivate here. Rather, it is also and especially because, even to exist, let alone to perform those functions, the militia must embody and guarantee a national identity that rejects whatever is narrowly racist, sectarian, politically partisan, or aligned in the manner of robots with any particular social stratum, economic class, faction, or special interest group, be it foreign or domestic. So, once again organized a militia appropriate for a free state, and a republican form of government, and adhering to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, we the people will never follow or fall victim to a domestic or foreign plutocracy, oligarchy, tyranny, or any species of self-styled elite that pretends to superiority by dint of genetic endowment, material wealth, geographical origin, or even God's supposed favoritism. As a practical matter, too, revitalized militia will bring together and merge the efforts and interests of individuals from every socio-economic stratum and from all walks of life, in the close cooperation necessary for effective musters, training, and operations in the field. And through those activities will compel, hasten, and facilitate legal immigrants' assimilation into American culture and their acceptance by their fellow citizens. Moreover, the growing esprit de corps of militia units, derived from citizens' common participation in the defense of a country common to all, will naturally foster the enlightened patriotism essential for true homeland security in a nation the very independence of which rests on the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. In any event, that revitalizing the militia of the several states will engender social unity among Americans cannot remain simply a theory or naive hope, but instead must soon be put to the test if America is to survive as a free and independent commonwealth. With political and cultural manipulators openly generating tsunamis of immigration, both legal and illegal, 
to feed maelstroms of multiculturalism, pluralism, and diversity aimed at polarizing and fragmenting America's population. Only Pollyannas cannot see that powerful forces at work in the world intend to destroy this country and to erect upon its ruins at the expense of its inhabitants a new world order that rejects everything for which the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution stand. In the face of this threat, Americans must learn to poll in unison for our country's benefit, or we will find our country pulled down on our heads. Even were these constitutional and social considerations not in and of themselves dispositive, no workable or desirable alternative to revitalization of the militia of the several states in aid of homeland security exists under present conditions. Whatever their ultimate causes and sources, private and state-sponsored, quote, terrorism, subversion, and other globally organized criminality, whether in open violation of law or under color of it, will not abate in the foreseeable future. Rather, such wrongdoing will likely spread and intensify, with increasingly destructive and even deadly consequences to common Americans. Moreover, that many leading politicians predict as much is self-fulfilling prophecy. Their political advantage demands that terrorism continues and even expands. To them, terrorism is not a problem to be solved, but an opportunity to be exploited for personal and party profit. Terrorism may even be necessary, inasmuch as no other excuse could rationalize the concentration in their hands of the exorbitant abusive powers they covet. Under these circumstances, for Americans to do nothing but react in an ad hoc fashion will concede the initiative to the terrorists and their sponsors, and to those who profit politically from their exercise and attacks, thereby increasing their numbers and magnifying their effectiveness. Yet to attempt to preempt terrorists through massive expansion of local, state, and especially national professional police forces where activation of the armed forces and intelligence agencies for parapolice functions must prove not only too costly, but of greater consequence, too dangerous to individual Americans' liberties. If a country dominated by professional police forces is ill-served, far worse off must be one in which police functions are militarized, such that direct military control of civilians, rather than civilian control of the military, becomes the rule. To be sure, to a certain extent this situation may be unavoidable in extreme circumstances. Even if only the militia were called forth to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, nonetheless, the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the militia of the several states when called into actual service of the United States, just as he is of the Army and Navy of the United States at all times and the office of commander-in-chief is of primarily a military, not a civilian character. In addition, when in actual service in time of war or public danger, persons in the militia may be held to answer for capital or otherwise infamous crime without the protection of a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, that is, according to the rigorous procedures of some variety of martial law. What may become unavoidable under the most extraordinary and dangerous circumstances, though, should never be suffered at other times. For as Blackstone taught the Founding Fathers, martial law, which is built upon no settled principles, but is entirely arbitrary in its decisions, is in truth and reality no law, but something indulged rather than allowed as a law. The necessity of order and discipline in an army is the only thing which can give it countenance, and therefore it ought not to be permitted in times of peace, when the courts are open for all persons to receive justice according to the laws of the land. In any event, even when the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Militia of the several states, and their members are in actual service in time of war or public danger, the Militia always remain composed of we the people. 
not professional police, soldiers, or intelligence agents, who might, and in a police or garrison state surely would, envision themselves as distinct and separate from, and even superior and antagonistic to, we the people. End of chapter 5